this exam. I mean, it's hard to fail this, this, these exams because uh, I am giving away basically the entire exam already. So you, have, you can use rubric one, which I just clicked on it, right? It's up on the, let me go back here. So down rock history, you see rubric exam one, you click on it. And this is basically the exam. So there will be 25 questions. And of course, I will remind you the day before the exam, I will send an email and you will just log in into the into the into uh, into the the system and to take the exam actually since we are here let me show you right now again um so if you click on uh, uh, let if you go back to quizzes instead of files you click on quizzes you will see quiz one here we go then obviously now it says not available until September 22nd or September 23rd if you are in my Wednesday night class, okay? So I always have to specify this. So September 22nd is if you are in my Tuesday and Thursday class and September 23rd if you are in my Wednesday night class, okay? The same thing applies to all the other side, to the other uh, quizzes. So obviously it says not available, but on September 22nd or September 23rd, depends on which section are you in, it will say available you click on it and you will start taking the quiz. Once you take the quiz, you cannot log out. So you need to make sure that, that you, you take the quiz without logging out, okay? Then on, for the exam one is the same thing. On, on uh, September 29 or, uh, or the 30th, if you are my Wednesday night class, you click on it, you will take the exam, there are 25 questions, then you will submit it. Do not log out while, while you're doing the exam. Okay, make sure you, you click on it, you log in, and you finish the exam. So that's how you access the exam. Click on quizzes, and you will see them. I'm going to go back to files. And let's talk about the first exam. So this is the exam review. I'm going to go over each single question. Okay, nothing more, nothing less. These are the questions of the exam. So we talked about the first questions concern the graded perfect system, and I talked about this uh, during the first uh, video, in the first video, actually in the second video, sorry, so lecture one. Um, and again, the first exam will focus on the first two videos, so lecture one and two, okay? Later on, I will upload the third lecture. The greater perfect system, what was this greater perfect system? The greater perfect system was a, a theoretical, basically, system uh, developed by the Greeks, which consisted of, that's the question, so it was two octaves, because two octaves is 16 notes. One octave has eight notes, and so if you add two octaves, you have 16 notes. Or you can think of it as four tetrachords, because one tetrachord is four notes, right? And that's in the slide, so it's all underlined. So you need four tetrachords to come up with uh, 16 notes. So either two octaves or four tetrachords, it's the same thing. And question two would be the Greek scholion. What's the Greek scholion? I, I mentioned that in uh, Greek culture, you know, poetry was very important. So the Greek scholion was basically a, br a brief lyrical poem set to music. So it's like a song today. So you have the lyrics, right? In this case, it was in Greek, of in Greek, in the Greek language, obviously. Uh, today would be in English or whatever language we use. And then uh, you set this poem to music. You can have rhymes, right, or not, no rhymes. It really depends. So it's a brief lyrical poem set to music. A uh, very important question, which is the third question, is what is uh, um, when uh, uh, do we find the earliest form of notation here? around the 9th century, and I, and I showed you the manuscript with um, diastematic and chironomic notation, so the one with lines and no lines, so those, those really the, this is really the beginning of uh, notes, as we think of notes today, even though those kind of, this kind of notation was much more primitive, much more rudimental, okay? This is the earliest form of notation around the 9th century, so 900, so about 1,100 years ago. Speaking of notation, what are the neumes, which is a different question. Um, the neumes were those signs, those calligraphic signs or symbols placed above the text. And if you go back to the lecture one video, you will see that there are uh, some uh, uh, manuscripts that I showed you already with the neumes, right? So those are the neumes. 
just, just signs placed above the text to indicate the melody. Very approximate, though. There's no indication of rhythm or uh, or pitch. Okay. Chironomic diastematic notation. I just mentioned that. So chironomic notation has no lines. Diastematic notation has lines. That's the difference. Syllabic versus melismatic. That's another question. So syllabic. We talked about I talked about syllabic versus melismatic when I talk about chant, about songs in general. Uh, even today, if you say something is syllabic or a song is melismatic, what does it mean? It means that syllabic means when you have one note per syllable. And, and, and melismatic means well, you have many notes per syllable, okay? I have to correct this, this is a mistake here, but anyway. So syllabic has one note per syllable, melismatic has one, many notes per syllable. Why is this guy important? That's a different question. Guido Ovarezzo, why it was important? Because, for two reasons, that's what I want to know in the exam. Because he, introduced, he basically invented the music stuff with the name of the notes that we use today. And the second one is the musical hand, which is much more weird. The musical hand was the hand, the graph I showed you in the, in the first lecture, I mean the first video, which is a hand that is used by the singers to memorize distance between the notes. So the first two, the two innovations were the music stuff, right, that we still use today, and uh, the, the the musical hand to indi to uh, to help the singers memorize the distance between the notes. We talked about polyphony. That's a very important topic. The difference between monophony and polyphony. So monophony is just one melody. Polyphony is two or more melodies simultaneously. So the what is the question is what is the first theoretical source of polyphony, right? It's called the, one of the first, Musica Inchiriadis. You have to memorize the name here. I will give a bunch of incorrect names, and then you, it's a multiple choice exam, of course. So you need to individuate which one is the uh, correct answer. So the Musica Inchiriadis would be the answer, the first theoretical source. So the first manuscript that talks about polyphony. One of the first practical sources, so the, the source uh, that actually has the music, not it just... It talks about it, but he also showed the man. Actually, it's actual the, comp, the actual compositions is the Winchester Troper, and is actually the first practical source of polyphony. Next question. Now, if we actually, if you live back at the time and you talked about polyphony, they would not understand you because polyphony is a term that we use today. So the question is, what what was the name they used? at that time, in the medieval times, to refer to polyphony. It was organum, this one here. Okay, so organum was the name, sorry, organum was the name that they used to talk about polyphony. Okay, so early polyphony was called organum. Next question. Why is the Codex Calixtinus important? Why is this manuscript called Codex Calixtinus important? So we talked about how the, the fact that uh, before the 12th century, 11th century, most music was anonymous because there was no reason to credit anyone, right? But now, by, by the 12th century, we see we start to see manuscripts which ascribe names of composers to specific, to, uh, to specific compositions. That's important. So now we actually have the name of the composer. So the Codex Calistinus is important because it's one of the first manuscripts, if not the first, to ascribe specific and to ascribe composers' names to specific pieces. What's a trope? A trope is an addition of text or music. To a, or both to a pre-existing chant. So in other words, you have a song, you have a religious song, but you don't have enough words in it and you need more lyrics, so you add music or you add text, or you add lyrics. This process is called trope. So a trope is the addition of music or text to a pre-existing chant. And everything, again, everything is in the slides underlined, so you cannot miss it. And these are the questions, so really there's no need really to study all the slides again. Hildegard of Bingen 
what was she famous for? She's very, she was a very knowledgeable woman who composed many chants. And the question I want to know is, where are all her chants or all of her uh, songs, religious songs, collected? And which manuscripts? So the name of the manuscript is this one, Symphonia, here. And you can see, you, you will, it, it, is in the, it is in bold in the slide, so you cannot miss it. Really. So the title of the manuscript is Symphonia. We also talked about something very important, I talked about in the video, with, with, with basically the secular music. So by the 13th century, the, 12, the late 12th century, we see the first example of secular music, so non-religious music. And, um, and this was uh, composed by these gentlemen here, Troubadour and Trouveri. Who were these Troubadour and Trouveri? Troubadour and Trouveri were poets slash musicians who were active in France at the beginning, but then eventually all over Europe. So the Troubadour and Trouvier were itinerant poets slash musicians. So itinerant because they traveled from one court to another court. Then the next question is, who are the Mina singers? The Mina singers are the same thing as the Troubadour and Trouvier. So they are poets, musicians, but in Germany. So they wrote poems and music in uh, in German, not in French. Okay, so the Minna singer. And then I mentioned about the polyphonic school of compositions, which was centered in Paris, in Notre Dame, right? And that's the question actually. It was this school was headed by these two composers? Their names were respectively were Levinus and Perotinus. And uh, I want to know. Where was this school located? And you will say Notre Dame in Paris. Okay. What, next question. What's that the term? What does the word uh, antiphonal mean? What does it mean? Antiphonal means when you have two groups singing, so they alternate. So in other words, you have one choir, one group sings, and then the other responds. That's called antiphonal. It means two alternating, sometimes more than two, but in general it's two alternating groups singing. Fixed form, I talked about the songs at the time, the idea of songs which, which had an A, B, A, C form, like things like that. Uh, this idea comes, uh, you know, it was developed during this period as well. So the fixed form, I want to know the three names of the French form fix which are the ballade, the virele, and the rondo. In this case, uh, you're going to have to memorize the names. I usually don't uh, ask you to memorize names that much, but in this case, you have to memorize the names. So ballade, virele, and rondo. Those are the fe French fixed forms for songs, for secular songs. Another manuscript. Why is the Squarcialupi Codex important? Why is this manuscript important? Because it is the largest collection of 14th century Italian secular music, so of early Renaissance music. So the Squarcialupi Codex is the largest collection of early Renaissance music, of 14th century Italian music. Speaking of Renaissance, you have to... You have to know this very, that's a general question, but when, the, where did the Renaissance begin? Which, what is considered to be the cradle of the Renaissance? Which place? And the answer is Florence in Italy. Right? Okay. Uh, next question. Um, what's a Cantus Firmus Mass? This was deleted by the in the slides I have to add it again. A Cantus Firmus Mass is a mass that paraphrases a pre-existing chant. So in other words, you have a, a chant, right? Like a religious chant, and then you add voices on top of it. So you, you make it polyphonic. And this is called Cantus Firmus Mass. So it's a mass based on or that paraphrases a, a chant. These very strange words here, the Kanti Karnashaliski, what are those? That's the question. It's much more simple than you think. 
there are carnival songs because I talked about how car. I mean, I mentioned how carnival songs were very carnival was very important in the Renaissance, and the songs too. So the carnival songs were very very important. They were some kind of popular music. Carnival songs. What's the frottola is another kind of popular music at that time, which was it was strictly secular, so it was not religious at all. And flourish around 1470 to 1520. That's roughly the period. So, the carnival songs. It's a question. It's a question. And the other question is about the frottola, which is another kind of secular song, which developed from 1470 up to 1520. On the other hand, when well, that's another question, so that's question 24. I talked about the madrigal as a serious, more serious genre. So it was not supposed to be funny. It was not supposed to be a kind of song, a kind of music that uh, was supposed to be danced to or f make you f laugh. It was more serious. I want to know two of the early composers of this madrigal were, that's the question, answer is Arcadel and Berdelot. The, these are the names of the composers. There were two actually French composers who went to work in Italy because that's where most composers were at that time. That's where the money was. Then, then the last question, so it's question 25, what are the three dances in the Renaissance? You have to know the name here. I will give you a bunch of incorrect names, A, B, C, D, and then you have to individuate, individuate which, which one is the correct answer. So the three main Renaissance dances at the time were the Bastons, the, pa, yeah, the Pavan, and the Gaillard. Right? You don't have to know the difference in, for this question, I, even though I explained a little bit in the, in the video, just briefly, but you have to know the name. So the three dan Renaissance dances are the Bas Nods, the Pavan, and the Gaillard. All right, so the, you, you will see that these are, the, uh, these are the 25 questions of the exam. There's nothing more and nothing less. That's it. That's what you have to study for it. You will see that this corresponds to the questions that are under, to the sections that are underlined or involved in the slides. So you cannot really go wrong. Again, there's 25 questions. This is the exam. Okay, just focus on this to prepare for the exam. Okay, if you want, you can scan through the slides to contextualize these questions, but that is it. That's pretty much what, what the, the exam will be about, will, will be. Okay, okay. Do, do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. And uh, the next video will be not anytime soon, though. It will be probably in a week or so, because I want to give you, I want, I want you to focus on the first exam and the quiz. So there's no really need to study the another lecture if the exam stops here, because the exam stops at week three slides, week uh, beginning of week four. So which would be a response to lecture one and lecture two. So the videos of lecture one and lecture two. Okay, so that's what you have to focus on until the day of the quiz and the exam. Quiz one and rubric one. That's it. Okay, bye bye.